Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. I'm glad you braved the cold to make it to the uh, White House today. Uh, I don't have anything at the top, Josh, so if you want to get us started with, with questions, I'll let you go first. Thanks, Josh. I wanted to ask about the uh, 800,000 uh, Americans who won't be able to file their taxes on time because the government sent them incorrect uh, tax information after they bought insurance through healthcare.gov. Uh, what went wrong, and what is the administration doing to fix it? Well, Josh, uh, let me just correct one fact in your question. Sure. There, uh, this should have no impact on the ability of people to file their taxes on time. Uh, I would anticipate, uh, HHS has said that they anticipate that they'd be able to send uh, these updated forms in the next couple of weeks. So it'd be ample time for people to file in advance of, uh, of April 15th. Um, it's important for us to sort of take a step back here and recognize what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that you know, first of all, 75 percent of people who file their taxes uh, will just check a box in their tax forms to indicate that they have health insurance, whether that health insurance is provided through their employer, by Medicare, or even the VA. Uh, the form that you're talking about uh, only has an impact on those who are likely to qualify for tax credits uh, to make their health insurance more affordable. This is health insurance that they purchased through a marketplace. Uh, it's also true that the vast majority of people who filed, uh, who received this form, actually got the correct version of it. So we're talking about a, uh, a very small fraction of people who uh, are affected. 800,000 people is not a very small amount of people, though. Uh, it's a small percentage of overall tax filers. We're talking about less than 1 percent of people who file taxes. Uh, and each of these individuals are people who are eligible for uh, tax credits or are likely to be eligible for tax credits from the government. So we're talking about the, the question that has to be resolved is just how substantial of a tax credit are they going to receive from the federal government to make their health insurance uh, more affordable, uh, and that is uh, that is the question that they're that that HHS and the Treasury Department are working to resolve, uh, and we do anticipate that they'll be able to resolve this uh, within the next couple of weeks in terms of sending out the uh, updated form to the uh, small percentage of people who got the wrong one. And in terms of what what went wrong um, and what's being done to prevent that from happening again, can you give us some insight into that? Well, this is a process that's being run uh, at CMS, so I'd uh, encourage you to to direct your questions over there to uh, understand what sort of operational steps uh, they'll be taking to ensure something like this doesn't happen again. Okay. Uh, the Pentagon has started laying out details uh, about this operation to retake Mosul that is going to be uh, getting underway in a couple months. Very specific operational details about how many Iraqi brigades, Peshmerga forces. And I'm wondering why detail this in advance? And doesn't that just give your playbook to the Islamic State and make it easier for them to prepare uh, to defend themselves against such an attack? Well, Josh, I think I saw many of the same news reports that you may have seen on this. Uh, this sort of operational planning that was discussed at the Department of Defense uh, is something that's uh, done by the Department of Defense. So uh, I'm not in a position to confirm the accuracy of those details. Um, but what you do know are a couple of things. The first is that, of course, the Department of Defense is working closely with Iraqi security forces to train and equip them and build up their capacity so that they can take the fight on the ground uh, in their own country um, to uh, the ISIL militants that have uh, encroached on their territory. So uh, this will be an effort that will be led by Iraqi security forces. The second thing is uh, that this, this is an offensive that won't begin. Uh, until the Iraqi security forces are ready. Uh, this is something that will be Iraqi-led, uh, and it will be carried out by Iraqi security forces. Now, they will, of course, be backed up by uh, the coalition uh, airstrikes that have proven um, quite effective on the battlefield against ISIL. Uh, and we would anticipate that with this advanced training, with new equipment, and with the strong support of uh, coalition military air power, uh, that the on the battlefield performance of uh, the Iraqi security forces will be enhanced. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but for the details about when this might commence, uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. And in, as it relates to uh, reports that we saw overnight about uh, what that offensive may look like, uh, I can't confirm the accuracy of that. Uh, and I'd refer you to the Department of Defense, who, again, may be in a position to offer you some more details about it. Sure. I'm not asking you to confirm the, the accuracy of those reports, but is there a concern among the National Security Council that if the Pentagon is, is handing out the playbook for what this operation is going to look like, that uh, it could make it less effective? Uh, I guess my, the point that I'm making here is that I cannot confirm that that is the playbook. Has the President made a decision yet about whether uh, during that Mosul operation to send in uh, a limited number of U.S. ground troops specifically to help call in airstrikes? 
Uh, the President has not made that decision. I'm not even in a position to confirm that that request has been made uh, by his military commanders. You know, this is something that General Dempsey discussed uh, in his testimony before Congress and at that point uh, last fall. And at that point, what he said was this was an option that he would uh, consider recommending to the President, but as of last fall, uh, he had not made a decision to recommend to the President that that was something uh, that American military personnel should be in the position of doing. So, um, uh, so I don't have anything new to report on this. Uh, but, you know, what is true about the strategy that we have pursued here is that we believe it is in the best interests of American national security for the Iraqi people uh, and their nation's military forces to fight for their own country. Uh, and we tried it a different way. We tried it in the previous administration uh, with, uh, you know, by deploying, uh, you know, more than 100,000 uh, U.S. military personnel to go on the ground and uh, engage in sustained uh, offensive combat operations uh, in Iraq. And what we found is that the uh, security situation improved dramatically as a result of the courage uh, and effectiveness of American military personnel. Uh, but what we found was that that uh, solution uh, was not enduring. It did not endure uh, because there was not the, the uh, there was not sufficient buy-in from the Iraqi people. Uh, and that is why our strategy this time is necessarily different, that we want the Iraqi people to be fighting for their own country. Uh, and that's why the strategy, the President has pursued this strategy, because he believes it is in uh, the national security interest of the United States, uh, but also th that the Iraqi people uh, and the security situation uh, in Iraq will be better off uh, under this strategy as well. And since it's Friday, uh, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani and his <laughs> attempt to uh, clean up some comments he made about the President not loving America says it couldn't, he couldn't possibly have been uh, racist with those remarks because the President has a white mother and, and was, uh, grew up among white people. Um, any reaction to that from the White House? Well, Josh, I, I, I don't have a, a direct response to uh, Mr. Giuliani's comments, uh, either from Look, it looks like you have one to kind of way. look to right there. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll let you indulge me for a little bit. We'll see if I can give you something to work with, even if it's not a, a direct response to his comments. Um, you know, many of you have been in the room when the President's delivered speeches where he's talked about his love for this country uh, or how the United States is a force for good in the world. In fact, it's the uh, greatest force for good that the world has ever seen. Uh, and so I can, you know, we can send you those examples, and many of you have been in the room when he's delivered those remarks like that, uh, both in this country and around the world. Uh, more generally, I can tell you that it's sad to see when somebody who has attained a certain level of public stature and even admiration um, tarnishes that legacy so thoroughly. Uh, and the truth is I don't take any joy or vindication or satisfaction from that. I, I think really the only thing that, that I feel is I feel sorry for Rudy Giuliani today. Roberta. Um, on immigration, um, a couple of days ago um, you said that the administration would make a decision in a couple of days about whether to uh, pursue a stay of the Texas court judges. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Has a decision been made, and what's the holdup? Well, Roberta, what I can tell you is that the Department of Justice has made a decision to uh, file a stay in this case. Uh, I would anticipate that they will uh, file uh, documents at the district court level uh, on Monday at the latest. And um, so when they have filed those documents, we'll, they and we will be in a position to talk a little bit more about our uh, legal strategy. That, of course, is uh, separate and apart from our intent to pursue an appeal. That was something that we announced in the immediate aftermath of the decision. Uh, and we uh, will seek that appeal because uh, we believe that when you evaluate the legal merits of the arguments, uh, that there is a solid legal foundation for the President to take the steps that he announced late last year to reform our broken immigration system. That's consistent with the way that previous Presidents over the course of several decades have used their executive authority. Uh, and uh, that is why, we, you know, we're going to continue to pursue uh, this case to the legal system. So by filing a stay, what does that mean for people who are considering um, filing their paperwork for the programs? Well, the, the Department of Homeland Security has also put out a statement earlier this week indicating that at this point they're not prepared to accept applications for the program uh, that the President announced at the end of last year. Uh, but w once we have uh, taken some additional steps uh, through this legal process, we uh, may be in a position to give you an update about uh, the status of implementing the program. Obviously, some of this will depend on um, the way that uh, the question of a stay is resolved. Okay. If I may jump to one other topic sure. just briefly. 
Um, a senior Republican lawmaker, Kay Granger, has urged the administration to give Egypt fighter jets and weapons to fight ISIL, and she also wants to see weapons provided to Jordan and tools and training for, um, for the Peshmerga. And I'm wondering uh, whether the White House has a response to, to her demands and whether there's any sort of explanation about why there's been this holdup with the fighter jets specifically. Well, uh, Roberta, as you know, each of the countries that I, I, let me just start by saying I have not uh, seen the, uh, the remarks from Congresswoman Granger. I'm hearing them from you for the first time. Uh, but my initial reaction is that the countries that you and apparently she named uh, are all countries that have a robust security relationship with the United States, uh, a security relationship that's been enhanced under uh, the leadership of President Obama. That's true of, of Egypt, with whom we have a very important counterterrorism uh, relationship. We've obviously worked through uh, and in some cases are even still working through some of the differences that we have uh, with that government. Uh, but there is an important counterterrorism relationship between the United States and Israel, and we continue to believe that the interests of the United States are well served uh, by continuing to have a strong counterterrorism relationship with them. Uh, I think some, something similar could be said uh, about Jordan. So, um, certainly, uh, uh, you know, welcome her uh, interest uh, in this issue, uh, but the administration has been focused uh, for quite some time in making sure uh, that we are working to. Uh, maintain uh, a strong security relationship uh, with our allies and partners in the Middle East. Okay. Jim. Josh. Uh, just getting back to Mayor Giuliani, did, did the President have a reaction uh, to those comments? Not that I'm aware of. And um, on, on the President's uh, speeches this week on countering violent extremism, specifically the one yesterday, he talked about uh, some of the underlying issues that, that lead to extremism in, in the Muslim and Arab world, and he talked about uh, the need for economic opportunity, uh, human rights, democratic rights. Uh, but it seems that uh, many of the countries that he would be referring to are members of his own coalition. Uh, is the president going to be making that case to the Emir of Qatar, for example, uh, when he comes to the White House next week? Well, I don't want to preview those discussions, but it's true, Jim, that it wasn't a coincidence that the president was talking uh, about human rights and urging uh, those world leaders to be cognizant of universal human values and to do their part to protect them. Um, we do have important relationships with, with, uh, with those countries. Uh, they are valuable to um, enhancing U.S. national security around the globe. And yes, the President believes that it would be clearly in the interest of those countries, their leaders, and our national security uh, if many of those countries did a better job. Uh, of protecting the basic universal human rights of their citizens. Uh, that uh, there are cer certain circumstances where we know that the governments, um, you know, or governments around the world when they fail to protect those <coughs> human rights, uh, that that only makes the recruiting ground for some terrorists more fertile. Uh, that it, uh, and this, that this is what the President was talking about uh, in his remarks. And so, no, it is not a coincidence that in a room full of our allies and partners, some of whom uh, don't live up to the kinds of standards that we wish they would when it comes to human rights, that the President brought it up. So these countries are, are breeding grounds for, for terrorists. <laughs> I, I, th that's not what I said. That's not what the President said. But, but, I, mean, that is in I mean, that is in fact a potential. I mean, that is, if he's, if he's talking to these countries and they have these issues. And well, again, I, Jim, I'd encourage you to check the, the, the President's speech. Can I ask you about immigration? Uh, is, the, would, is the President uh, ruling out a continuing resolution? Uh, to keep the Department of Homeland Security open? Uh, the President believes that uh, the Congress, uh, particularly Republicans in Congress who, know have the, who now have the majority in both the House and the Senate, should fulfill their responsibility to ensure uh, that the Department of Homeland Security uh, doesn't shut down at the end of this month. Uh, you know, we're basically about a week away from the funding for the Department of Homeland Security running out. Uh, it's running out because Republicans insisted uh, on not funding it for a full year at the end of last year. Uh, and it's a you know, on the brink of running out because Republicans have failed uh, to take the steps that are necessary at the beginning of this year uh, to ensure that the operations of that department are, are properly funded. So uh, we certainly hope that they will. I, you know, there are all kinds of proposals that are floating out there, and uh, I'm not in a position to react to, to any of them specifically, but I, you know, I, I will just say as a general matter that it is the responsibility of uh, Republicans in Congress to do their job. But he'll sign something to keep things going. <coughs> if it's necessary for a couple of days to work out specifics or. Well, again, I, I don't want to. Uh, I, I haven't seen any sort of specific proposals like that. But let me uh, just also say that, you know, 
Congress is going to be returning from a week-long recess next week. Uh, you know, so on Monday, members of Congress from all over the country, many of them are going to board airplanes uh, to return to Washington, D.C. Uh, and as they do so, they're going to go through security, just like other Americans. And I hope that they're going to take a minute uh, and look in the eye of TSA officers uh, who are representing their country. These are patriotic Americans who are defending the transportation system, defending the airports, defending the safety of the traveling public. And I hope that they will uh, think about them as they come back to Washington and consider what they're going to do to fund the Department of Homeland Security. Because if they don't, those individuals who process their luggage, who, who they had to look in the eye, will continue to do their job. These are good Americans. They're patriotic. They take their work seriously. They're professionals. But they're not going to get paid on time unless members of Congress step up and do their jobs. Uh, and we're hopeful that when, uh, when Republicans um, uh, confront that uh, reality, uh, that they'll do the right thing. John. Uh, Josh, uh, coming back to the uh, three-day summit on combating violent extremism, why was FBI Director James Comey not invited to that summit? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of reasons. One is his boss was. Uh, the nation's top law enforcement official, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder, attended. Uh, the second is we also had law local law enforcement officials from across the country who could talk about uh, their own experience uh, in working with community leaders to, um, to counter violent extremism in their communities. Uh, and the third is, you know, there was an we wanted to make sure that uh, there wasn't a um, uh, that, that, that there wasn't a perception uh, that this conference was overly focused on law enforcement tactics. Certainly law enforcement is a very important role to play. That's why we had the nation's top law enforcement official in attendance. That's why we had police chiefs and other law enforcement officials from communities across the country in attendance. Uh, but the focus here is on the broader set of tools that are available to communities all across the country uh, to protect vulnerable uh, people who uh, could be susceptible to uh, violent <coughs> Uh, extremist ideology that's propagated on social media. But Josh, in terms of combating violence, let me try that again. In terms of combating violent extremism, it's countering violent extremism. Okay, but countering. Mm -hmm. So we, well, I assume we want to combat it too. But we do. So in terms of but. countering violent extremism, isn't the FBI director the head of the agency that is on the front line of doing exactly that? So you are. You're having a summit, a three-day meeting, mm -hmm. on countering violent extremism, and you don't invite the lead official in charge of countering violent extremism. That's right. We just invited his boss. But, okay. And then, so you, you invite the attorney general. You don't have the FBI director. But you did have the head of the Russian security service there. Mm -hmm. uh, how how, how Ho does that look? Hopefully he was listening carefully when the president was talking about the importance mm -hmm. of of, uh, of governments respecting and protecting basic universal human rights. But you don't think that sends um, a strange message to have the head of the Russian FSB, the successor to the KGB, at this meeting and not the FBI director? Well, uh, to be clear about the Russian official who attended, the United States issued an invitation to the country, uh, and Russia, in this case, made the decision about, about which official from their government would represent them. So uh, it wasn't as if there was a, uh, uh, an invitation that was sent specifically to this official. Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, official that the Russian government uh, chose to represent them at the at the summit. Was there any hesitation of having that official there from Russia, given that he is on the European Union's sanctions list uh, related to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Another question about this: I know you've gone back and forth over why the president uh, officials don't use Islamic terror as a term or Islamic extremists. When, I think it's fair to say that we've terror. all gone back and forth yes, over that. So, but, but, but I just want to be just, just to button it up and be clear. The, the, okay. the White House, the President, you don't deny that in terms of the current threat, the groups that we are battling now, the primary threat are Islamic extremists. That, well, that, that's, not a, that's not something you disagree with, is it? Uh, John, there is no doubt, uh, and I said, I, I said this, if you go back and look at the comments well, the last time that we went around on this on, on Wednesday, uh, I, I think I was pretty clear about this, that there is a very real threat that is emanating from some of the darkest corners of the Muslim community around the world uh, that does threaten Americans, uh, and that is a threat that we are very cognizant of, is and the there are substantial... We're facing right now? Are there, well, uh, in terms of countering violent extremism, yes. of course it is. Okay. Uh, it's not the only threat that we face, but of course it's the primary one. There's no doubt about that. Okay, and then just uh, button up on Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. um, you said something interesting. You, you said you, uh, I, I 
correct me, but you, you basically feel sorry for him. I mean, this is kind of a you're kind of sorry to see what what's happened here. Well, look, do, I, do, do you think Rudy Giuliani has lost it? Uh, I, I I don't know, but I, look, any time that we have, there is somebody who has attained a certain level of public stature and uh, and even admiration in some cases to see uh, that person uh, so thoroughly tarnish their legacy. It's it's sad, uh, and I again, th there's no element of schadenfreude that people are feeling around here. Uh, you know, the fact is, I think what people are feeling is sorry for Rudy Giuliani. And, and, and because, I, again, on his specific allegation, which, you know, uh, however you want to characterize it, but, yeah. I mean, he says that he doesn't believe the president loves America. Yeah. Well, at the, again, I, you know, there are, are, are some, a number of examples, and, you know, John, you've traveled around the world with the president, so uh, you know firsthand uh, that there are a number of situations which the president said exactly that. You know, the most high-profile example that I could think of uh, was actually the last line of this year's State of the Union, uh, in which the president said, "God bless this country we love." Why? What, what makes somebody of that stature, Rudy Giuliani? What makes him say something like that? I, I don't know. Ed. Josh, given your sorrow for uh, Rudy Giuliani, do you think the president has any regrets about saying President Bush was unpatriotic for adding four trillion dollars to the debt? Um, and I, I don't know if sorrow was the word that I would use. Uh, I think you said I feel sorry for Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, I do. I do feel sorry so for you. You feel sorry, but does the president have any regrets, regardless of what Giuliani said? As a candidate, Senator Obama said that President Bush was unpatriotic. I, I think, uh, again, I, I haven't seen the actual uh, comments. I don't know if you have them there in front of you. He said uh, that the president, I'm paraphrasing this part, uh, had added about $4 trillion to the debt, and then he said, quote, that's irresponsible that's unpatriotic. Yeah. So I see a difference from Giuliani because he's talking about an issue, mm -hmm. but nonetheless questioning the patriotism of the President of the United States. Yeah. I, I think that what the President was doing was he was questioning the specific wisdom of that decision uh, and questioning whether or not that was in the best interest of the country. He unwise. He said that's unpatriotic. Right. right. Uh, but again, he was talking about that. He was not talking about a person. And uh, again, I, I think there is a a lot that the president also had to say in the State of the Union about the, about the level of our discourse. And there is no doubt that we're going to have uh, significant disagreements across the aisle. And that is, uh, that is ultimately what a democracy is all about, where we go in and we debate the issues. Uh, but the president, as you'll recall in the State of the Union, said we should have a debate that's worthy uh, of the United States Congress and worthy of the country, uh, that there are uh, significant challenges facing this country. And, uh, you know, that sort of uh, resorting to um, you know, a, a politics in which, you know, we question each, each other's, uh, uh, you know, basic decency is, uh, you know, not consistent with the reason that a lot of people got into public service. On, on the summit, I want to go back to what John was asking you about James Comey. Uh, you made clear, well, look, his boss, Eric Holder, was there, but you also said we wanted to make sure this wasn't overly focused on law enforcement. Mm -hmm. With that decision and other decisions at the summit, were you tiptoeing around not offending Muslims, or is there some reason why? This was the summit was largely about just not offending Muslims for some reason. Yeah, I certainly don't think that's uh, the way that uh, anybody here would characterize the summit. I think this was uh, an opportunity for us to have a very frank discussion uh, with people all across the country uh, about steps that countries can take to try to protect their communities and try to prevent people uh, from being inspired by this right, radical ideology that is propagated through social media. And uh, I think the goal of this summit was actually not to tiptoe around these issues, but actually to confront them head on. Uh, and that's why we had leaders of the uh, uh, leaders of law enforcement. Uh, we had leaders of the Muslim community uh, who participated in this in this summit. Uh, and it was an opportunity for us to have a frank discussion of these issues. That uh, certainly, as John pointed out, uh, there is concern about uh, uh, about the way that some of this ideology has infiltrated some uh, Muslim communities. But uh, there is a uh, an extremist threat that el that inhabits other communities in this country, and we're mindful of those threats as well. Uh, and all of them were discussed at the summit. In terms of uh, confronting it head on, uh, the former CIA director, James Woolsey, was on CNN and said uh, that he believes by refusing to call it Islamic terror, the president, quote, looks scared. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I don't think that uh, the countless terrorists that have been wiped off the battlefield as a result of military action that this president has ordered uh, feel that the president's particularly fearful. On the health care issue, last one, um, I thought your narrative was that healthcare.gov was really doing a lot better. Who's going to be held accountable for what seems like a pretty big mistake? Well, Ed, as I, as I pointed out earlier, what we're talking about is we're talking about a form that, uh, that only has, uh, that will actually determine the size of the tax credit uh, that an individual will receive from the federal government that will make their uh, health care uh, more affordable. 
Uh, we're talking about less than 1 percent of taxpayers being affected. Uh, and we're talking about um, uh, government agencies between HHS and uh, CMS and the IRS that are responsible for making sure that this gets fixed and gets done right. And that's why we're going to address this promptly uh, and ensure that people can pay their taxes on time. Thank you. Okay. Alexis. Yeah, two quick things. Um, when the President selected Hillary Clinton to be Secretary of State, the White House and representatives of the Clintons spent some time talking about what some of the ground rules might be to uh, eliminate uh, maybe co conflicts with what Bill Clinton might be doing what the foundation might be doing, what the Clinton Global Initiative might be doing. And my question is, in relationship to some of the reporting about um, potential conflicts between Secretary of State's activities in the administration and the fundraising for the Family Foundation, does the President believe there are any legitimate questions that need to be answered about problems that he uh, and his representatives wanted to eliminate at the beginning? Uh, Alexis, I, this is a, a question that I haven't given a lot of thought. I think I'd refer you to the State Department for any sort of questions like this that may have arisen. Uh, I'm not aware of any, um, but, you know, as you pointed out, there was uh, an effort early on to make sure that, um, uh, that obviously the former President's, you know, large international profile um, was uh, clarified and distinct from the official uh, U.S. government activities. And there are uh, situations in which uh, former President Clinton uh, did play an important role in representing the interests of the United States government. You know, obviously there was uh, the effort that he led to um, build support for uh, rebuilding Haiti after they suffered that terrible earthquake. Uh, you know, obviously former President Clinton, um, you know, took a high-profile trip to North Korea uh, to um, recover a, a U.S. citizen that had been uh, detained there. So, um, you know, obviously uh, it, it's important to keep all of those things uh, uh, distinct. But uh, as it relates to any sort of questions like this, uh, I'm not aware of any that have been raised at this point. Can you follow up one quick uh, cleanup on, on what Josh was asking earlier? Maybe I'm the only one who's confused about this, but are you saying that on the final day of the um, summit that the President was not aware that there was a background briefing happening at the Defense Department to outline an operation that's supposed to happen in the spring? You seem to be suggesting the President was not aware of this. Well, I don't know that that was the focal point of Josh's question. Okay, so it is the question. He's aware of this operation, right? Well, um, you're asking like four different things at the same time here. Was the President aware of a background briefing that was being conducted by uh, some military officials at the Central Command? Uh, I don't know that the, the President was. Um, well, uh, you're talking about an operation, the details of which I'm not able to confirm. So if you are asking about whether or not the President is aware that the United States military is engaged in an effort to strengthen and fortify the Iraqi security forces, back them up with military air power so that they can start retaking chunks of their country, uh, the President isn't just aware of that mission, he's the one who ordered it. Right, but maybe my confusion is about why you cannot comment on detail on the operation, but yet you can comment on the strategy, and then right, because we're asking questions about... The Department of Defense is responsible for setting out the operational details of a mission, uh, and so that's why I'm directing questions about these about these operational details to the Department of Defense. You were aware that DOD was going to brief reporters. You. You were aware of that yesterday. Well, you were just asking about the President being aware of it, right? No, I'm asking you that. Uh, I don't know that I was necessarily aware that Central Command, not the Department of Defense, but the Central Command uh, was conducting a briefing. But again, there are any number of briefings that take place uh, across the federal government on a daily basis, and I don't sign off on all of them. Okay. So why, why are you shaking your head? I, I just, you know, it seemed like you were yeah. I, I guess if I did sign off on these background briefings, I might be accused of mismanage or, uh, no, no, no. You were asking, right, you were uh, micromanaging the Department of Defense, and I certainly wouldn't want to be accused of doing that. Right? Okay. Cheryl. Thanks, Josh. Getting back to uh, funding for Department of Homeland Security, um, the President met with Senator Reid this week. Did they discuss a, a path forward, or, or have you had conversations with the Hill and see how, how, what do you expect to happen next week? Yeah. Well, Cheryl, I think the ball is in the court of the uh, majorities in the House and Senate to make a decision uh, about whether or not they're going to fulfill their responsibility uh, to ensure that the Department of Homeland Security is, is properly funded. Uh, if they don't take action uh, by the end of next week, uh, then we'll be in a position where there are DHS personnel that are showing up on a daily basis to protect our ports, to protect our borders, to protect uh, the friendly skies, so to speak, uh, who will be doing so without collecting a paycheck on time. And uh, the President doesn't believe that's fair. He also doesn't believe that's in the best interest of our homeland security. So 
Uh, we are concerned about the impact that this, uh, that this disruption in funding could have uh, on Homeland Security operations. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, Republicans will do the right and responsible thing uh, and, uh, and ensure that that agency is funded. Is that really kind of what you're expecting is, is maybe a shutdown? Yeah. Again, you know, prognosticating uh, when it comes to congressional action, particularly now that there's this Republican majority in place, uh, is not something I'm willing to do, at least in public. All right. Uh, Mark, you have a birthday coming up, I see. Yeah. Happy early, happy, happy early birthday. I'll, I'll withhold the, uh, those details in terms of your age. Thanks. Uh, the tax forms that went out erroneously, I realize yeah. you're saying it's a small fraction of the forms that went out, but yeah. we still have nearly a million people, roughly, mm -hmm. who are going to have to wait to file their returns. Admittedly, they'll, they'll be able to do that before April 15th, mm -hmm. but many of those people are owed refunds. So this is money that the government's going to be hanging on to for weeks, at least, and they won't be able to file for their returns. Aren't those people owed an apology? Uh, that's a... Well, here's what I'll say, Mark. The, um, the IRS and CMS are working diligently to address uh, this problem, and it's something that they take seriously. Um, but you are right to point out that the individuals who are affected are individuals who uh, have received a, uh, or are receiving a uh, tax credit from the government uh, to make their health insurance more affordable. And um, you know, this is why they're working expeditiously to address this problem. And like I said, uh, we do anticipate that in the next couple of weeks we'll have this uh, cleared up. So no apology is necessary for the fact the government's going to be hanging on to their money for weeks? Well, uh, I guess, um, Mark, w what we're trying to do here is to, to try to solve this problem. And certainly the American people uh, should hold their government to a high standard and should count on uh, these kinds of uh, operations being uh, implemented effectively. And when they're not, they should uh, expect government officials to uh, step forward and solve them as quickly as possible, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. Some of those people also are going to have to refile their taxes. Those who've already filed, they're going to have a substitute form. Is this another self-inflicted wound, Josh? Yeah. Well, uh, in terms of the mechanics about whether a refiling is necessary, I'd refer you to, to, IR, to the IRS. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Well, in any event, is okay. it another self-inflicted wound? Well, it certainly is, uh, uh, is something that uh, we want to make sure doesn't happen again. Okay. John. Josh, about the president's remarks that I watched a little bit earlier, the president spoke at the DNC, and I realize it's a, it's a, sort of an opportunity to cheerlead for um, fellow Democrats, but this meeting comes, uh, I guess you could say, on the heels of a, a very bad midterm election. Um, Democrats lost the Senate. Uh, they lost more seats in the House. Why was there, in the president's remarks, no recognition of that? Because yeah, uh, I guess, John, what the, the president uh, talked very directly in his remarks about the need for the country to look forward. Uh, and that's what he's focused on, is the future of the country. Uh, and the President wanted to talk about what are the values that uh, he believes the party should stand for. He's the, you know, the nominal lead of the uh, head of the Democratic Party, is the highest ranking uh, elected official in the Democratic Party. And uh, that's what he was there to do, was to sort of lay out what he believed was uh, his own vision for the country and how that's consistent with the values that our party has espoused for uh, quite a long time. The President, though, it seemed, was looking backwards in a way. He said, the American people stand right beside us on most of these issues. And if that's the case, why did Democrats do so poorly in, in the midterm elections, if they do stand beside the President on so many of these issues? Yeah. I, John, people have spent the last four months or so, uh, you know, combing through the results of the midterm elections with their own theory and analysis about the outcome. And um, you, you're welcome to continue doing that, but I, I think I'm done of ISIS to um, this group that gathered today yeah. here in Washington? Uh, this was, a, frankly, this is speaking to a political group and focused on politics, and they did spend a lot of time talking about, um, uh, about the economy. Um, but, you know, frankly, when it comes to national security, the President doesn't believe, um, you know, necessarily that, um, that that's at the top of the list when we're talking about politics, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, we'll move around a little bit. Uh, Byron. Thanks, Josh. Was the White House aware that the NSA reportedly stole information from a private European company uh, in order to access encrypted cell phone data? Is that something the White House is aware of or signed off on? Well, uh, you know, Byron, you're talking about a, uh, I believe you're talking about a, the, you know, the latest report from, um, uh, from The Intercept, I believe that publication is called. Um, I, I don't have any uh, specific information about that. I'd refer you to, uh, to the NSA. I believe that the documents, however, that uh, were the basis of that report were actually uh, from, um, 
from the UK. Dealt so. with a, a U.S. agency, it's right. a joint operation. Right. But again, I, I, I'm not going to be in a position to, to confirm or to discuss the details of uh, those documents. I'd refer you to the to the U.K. government Is about that. Is that a legal authority, though, that the White House claims the ability to hack a private company? For security reasons, whether it's in an allied country or not, I mean, is there a legal theory underpinning well, this? Well, uh, for for the um, you know, for the legal basis of uh, some of these kinds of questions, I'd refer you to uh, either the DNI or the NSA. One more try. Um, you know, the White House recently has talked a lot about building public-private partnerships with U.S. tech companies for cybersecurity reasons. Can the can the U.S. tech industry trust the U.S. government in the wake of some of these disclosures? Well, uh, Byron, we certainly uh, are aware of how important it is for uh, the United States government to work with private industry, that there are a lot of situations in which our interests are pretty cleanly aligned. Uh, and um, there are certainly steps that the U.S. government has taken in the name of national security that, uh, that some members of private industry haven't agreed with. Uh, but I, I do think that there is common ground when it comes to, and this is a, a principle that I cited before, it's hard for me to imagine that there are a lot of technology executives that are out there that are in a position of saying that they hope that uh, people who wish harm to this country will be able to use their technology to do so. Uh, so I, I do think, in fact, that there are opportunities for uh, the private sector and the federal government to coordinate uh, and to cooperate on these efforts, uh, both to keep the country safe, uh, but also to protect our civil liberties. We're talking about uh, technology companies and technology executives that have a lot of expertise in this area. And uh, we can benefit from their insight and their perspective as we confront, uh, I think what everybody acknowledges are some pretty thorny uh, public policy issues. Uh, but by working together, we are confident that we can reach uh, a, uh, some common ground that reflects the necessary balance of protecting civil liberties, but also protecting the national security of the United States. Okay. Chris. Well, the second part of the Obamacare announcement today had to do with uninsured Americans, and there's going to be a special period for them, people who didn't realize that they were going to have to pay a penalty uh, for not signing up for Obamacare. Is the White House concerned that this latest problem with the taxes will reinforce a perception in some quarters that parts of Obamacare are broken and, and will make people who are uninsured less likely to sign up? No, if anything, Chris, I think this is an opportunity for us to talk about the fact that there are millions of people all across the country who can go to a marketplace, who can shop for health care, and they can actually get a tax credit from the federal government to make that health care more affordable. Uh, and so... But you can understand why someone would say, yeah, but if I had signed up for Obamacare, I could potentially not have my tax return now, or, or I will have to go back to the Treasury Department. I can't file yet. Yeah. Does it perpetuate an idea that there are these problems with Obamacare. No, again, I think it is a good reminder that there are millions of people that stand to benefit from this law, and all they need to go to, to do is to go to the marketplace. And there are some people who, as you point out, uh, may still be unaware of the fact uh, that they will face a penalty if they don't uh, sign up and if they haven't signed up. And that is why uh, the uh, IRS and the Treasury and HHS have coordinated on what we believe is a pretty novel uh, solution to this challenge, which is to set up the special enrollment period for individuals who uh, did have to pay a penalty in their 2014 taxes for not having health insurance uh, and were previously unaware that they were required to do so. And so there will be this limited six-week window uh, in which those individuals can ensure that, uh, uh, that they can limit the penalty that they have to pay uh, and actually make sure that that money is going to a good purpose, which is uh, protecting uh, themselves and members of their family with health insurance. And how do you respond to Republicans who say this is just another example of how this was not well thought out? that is a constantly moving target. They're constantly changing the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I think what I would do is I would just refer them to uh, the seniors uh, across the country who have saved billions of dollars on their prescription drugs because of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I'd refer those Republicans to the fact that uh, since the Affordable Care Act went into effect, health care costs have gr grown at the slowest rate in recorded history. Uh, I would note that the, uh, that the uninsured rate uh, in the United States uh, has gone down faster than at any time since the early 1970s. Uh, and I just point out also that hospitals have saved an estimated $5.7 billion just last year uh, in lower uncompensated care costs. That's good for our deficit. Uh, it's certainly good for the bottom line of those hospitals, and it's also good uh, for uh, every American in the country that has insurance because it's going to have an impact on their premiums. So 
Uh, there, are, there are substantial benefits associated with the Affordable Care Act, and I recognize that it's awkward for some Republicans who voted against the law that has uh, uh, resulted in such significant benefit for the country. Uh, that's probably pretty difficult for them to explain, so I can Im imagine uh, that they may be looking for an opportunity to try to uh, wriggle out of that. But uh, that's going to become uh, just more and more difficult if, uh, as time moves on here. If I can read one sentence from the President's remarks today at the DNC, taking them out of context, but uh, he said, it's making a nation we love more perfect. Mm -hmm. Was that written in after as a response to Rudy Giuliani? Uh, it was not. As I, as I pointed out, the President said something very similar at the end of uh, the State of the Union address this year, the, uh, you know, God bless this country we love. So, uh, you know, the fact is the President often talks about his love for this country. It's uh, not unique. So, Lori, nice to see you. Good to see you, Josh. Well, what is the reaction to the, the administration to the latest events um, in Venezuela? And also, um, President uh, Nicolas Maduro accused uh, the, uh, the government, the U.S. government, of trying to overthrow his government and a plot that they say discovered last Wednesday. So, these uh, allegations that we've seen from uh, the Maduro government, like all previous such a allegations, uh, are ludicrous. Uh, the fact is the Venezuelan government should stop trying to blame the United States and other members of the international community for events inside Venezuela. Uh, the Venezuelan government actually needs to deal with the grave situation that it faces. The United States is not promoting unrest in Venezuela, nor are we attempting to undermine Venezuela's economy or its government. Uh, in fact, the United States remains Venezuela's largest trading partner. The Venezuelan government should stop trying to distract attention from the, com from the country's economic and political problems and focus on, focus on finding real solutions through democratic dialogue among the people of Venezuela. Uh, the Venezuelan government should respect the human rights of its citizens and stop trying to intimidate its political opponents. And we continue to call on the Venezuelan government to release political prisoner prisoners, including dozens of stu students, uh, opposition leader Leopoldo Lopez, and mayors Daniel Sabalos and Antonio Ledesma. The U.S. government has already taken some actions against Venezuelan individuals with some sanctions. Are you considering any other action? Are you seeking, uh, maybe seeking help from other uh, countries in the hemisphere, like Brazil, that could put pressure on uh, the government of Nicolás Maduro? Well, I can tell you that uh, the Treasury Department and the State Department are obviously closely monitoring this situation and are considering uh, tools that may be available that could um, uh, better steer the, uh, the Venezuelan government in the direction that they believe they should be headed. Uh, that obviously means that we're continuing to engage uh, other countries in the region uh, and talking about uh, operating in coordinated fashion uh, as we deal with, um, as we deal with uh, the situation there. But uh, ultimately, uh, it's going to be the responsibility of the government of Venezuela to stop blaming other countries, including the United States, for their problems uh, and start tackling them head on. One last question. Sure. This is regard to um, the emergency state. <coughs> the Justice Department, I understand, uh, will file probably by Monday. If that is denied, what would be the next step for um, the administration? Yeah. And how well, frustrated would, would you be that these DACA DAPA would not be implemented? Yeah. Well, I don't want to assume the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rejection of a legal document that has not yet been created or filed yet. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to talk about this more next week, I'm sure. But the thing that you should remember is, in addition to the stay that we do anticipate will be filed by Monday at the latest, uh, the U.S. government will be appealing the decision. Uh, and the reason for that is we continue to believe that there is a solid legal foundation uh, for the steps that the President has taken to bring some accountability uh, to our broken immigration system. And there are a couple of other uh, important points that are worth noting about the ruling. Uh, while the first is that the ruling uh, did prevent the uh, federal government from issuing work permits and uh, requiring state agencies to issue driver's licenses and other documentation. The, uh, and I recognize that this is a, a ruling that some Republicans have cheered. Uh, the fact of the matter is those steps uh, are exactly the kind of steps that are required to bring millions of people out of the shadows, to make them submit to a background check, to make them pay taxes, to make them get right with the law, it's surprising to me that that kind of accountability is something that Republicans would actually oppose, not to speak of the kinds of significant economic benefits that would be associated uh, with these individuals actually paying taxes. The second thing is the court ruling doesn't, however, touch uh, 
the ability of this administration to make decisions about prosecutorial discretion. Uh, and one element of the President's proposed reforms was to ensure that our enforcement activities were, were focused on felons and not on families. That we believe that these efforts should be focused on, uh, on rounding up and deporting individuals that have a criminal history, uh, individuals that may pose a national security threat of some kind, uh, or individuals who may otherwise pose some kind of public safety threat to the communities in which they're living. Uh, what we should not be doing uh, is using those uh, very important but insufficient uh, enforcement resources to focus on, uh, on separating families. Uh, that, frankly, we need to be focused on the public safety risk that's out there. And that's why, you know, the DHS can provide you for uh, these materials, but, uh, or these metrics. But what we're seeing is an increasing number, uh, or an increasing percentage of deportations uh, has been individuals with a criminal history. Uh, and that's an indication that our enforcement efforts uh, are improving on this scale. Uh, and thanks to the efforts uh, uh, of uh, the President and this administration to exercise prosecutorial discretion, we're going to see that metric continue to improve, uh, and that's going to mean uh, safer communities for everybody. Okay. Bill. Back to cybersecurity and hacking. Mm -hmm. The journal yesterday said that three months after the State Department discovered hackers in its system, they're still there. Uh, last fall, I think around the end of October, you announced that there have been hackers discovered in the White House system. Are they still there? Well, um, what I can, the update that I have for you on the uh, incident here at the White House uh, is that we have taken appropriate steps to address the activity of concern and protect our systems. Uh, and although we have addressed uh, this particular incident, uh, we're mindful of the fact that uh, networks at the White House will continue to be a target. Uh, so we're going to continue to monitor our networks uh, for additional activity of concern. Um, over the course of that intrusion, I can tell you that our computer systems uh, were not damaged, uh, though some elements of the unclassified network were affected uh, when we took our initial mitigation steps. Uh, and that's something that we've talked about uh, before as well. Uh, we've restored the vast majority of services that we took offline during those mitigation efforts uh, and are continuing uh, to take additional steps to bolster our defenses. Uh, we're, all the, we're also focused on longer-term efforts to implement broad cybersecurity initiatives that will further protect uh, not just the computer network here at the White House, but all across the federal government. So are you saying that there have been no further intrusions into the White House system? Well, uh, what I'm saying is that we've taken appropriate steps to address this specific activity of concern that we discussed last fall, uh, and we've taken the necessary steps to ensure that our systems are protected. So you're not saying that there have been no further uh, intrusions? Well, uh, what I'm saying is as much as I can. Are you concerned about the State Department situation? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, of course we are. Um, we are certainly monitoring uh, that situation as well, but uh, in the same way that we monitor uh, reported breaches of uh, computer systems that affect U.S. agencies, U.S. companies, and U.S. infrastructure. Uh, now, uh, you know, we'd note that the Department of State uh, has been working closely with a variety of government agencies, including the FBI, on a comprehensive investigation uh, and a specific response uh, to the intrusion that there, um, that that's taken place over there, uh, and that work is ongoing. Okay, all right, Scott. Josh, on this question of the sort of awkward partnership with countries in the Middle East that contribute to the kind of grievances the president was talking about, he was asked about this specifically last month. Um, he'd just given a speech in India, talking about religious tolerance and women's rights, and then was headed to Saudi Arabia, and he said. At times. Sometimes we have to balance our need to speak to them about human rights with our immediate concerns in, counter, in, in terms of countering terrorism and dealing with regional stability. So my question is, is the President comfortable with the way that balance is struck right now, or is he worried that our immediate security concerns may be planting seeds for trouble down the road? Well, I think, Scott, this is something that's evaluated on an ongoing basis. But I think that the President's commitment to ensuring that the United States continues to be a beacon of liberty uh, and a country that stands at the vanguard of protecting uh, basic universal human rights, you know, is embodied in the fact that the President, when standing before these world leaders, uh, brought it up. Nobody asked him a question in the context of yesterday's summit. He brought it up proactively uh, and talked about the need uh, for countries to live up to uh, their requirements that they respect and protect the universal human rights of their citizens. 
Uh, and uh, the president did that for a variety of reasons. The first is it's consistent with our values. But the second is, as he explained, uh, it's consistent with the kinds of steps that countries around the world can take uh, to counter violent extremism. Uh, that as countries take steps that are detrimental to uh, human rights, uh, it can enhance the ability and create a more fertile recruiting ground for extremists. And that's exactly the uh, threat that we're trying to counter. Uh, and so, uh, but you know, the president has been pretty forthright about the need to uh, balance all of those concerns, that there are countries that don't have the kind of human rights record that we'd want them to have, uh, that yet still continue to be good partners with the United States uh, in a way that uh, is advantageous for our national security. So uh, there is, uh, you know, this, these are complicated issues, uh, ones that are constantly uh, under evaluation here. Uh, but you know, the, the President's seriousness uh, about these issues and about speaking up and speaking out for human rights, both because of the values associated with it, uh, but also because of the impact it has on our national security, um, uh, again, I think is uh, consistent with his decision uh, to raise it proactively at yesterday's summit. Okay. Fred. Couple things. Uh, uh, first, uh, with the DNC winter meeting going on today, uh, does the White House have any comment regarding the controversy in Florida with Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the allegation that she was willing to change her position on the medical marijuana? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of that situation, Fred. I'd, I'd refer you to the Congresswoman's office. Okay. Well, it was reported in Politico that she uh, talked to a, a donor and asked him to uh, take back his criticism of her if he she would change her position. Yeah. I, I didn't see the report. I'll have to go take a look at it. Uh, well, apologies to all okay. political executives out there. Okay. Uh, I, uh, an, uh, another question then. Um, okay. on, on the minimum wage, uh, you talked about that with a Walmart situation. Yeah. Uh, is, is there an argument, though, to be made that if Walmart is doing this voluntarily, that they see an economic benefit for their part, then there may not be a need for the government to step in a mandated wage if the private sector is taking the lead on this? Yeah. Well, I, that's. Um, that's certainly one argument. I think the argument, though, Fred, that I would make is that uh, executives at Walmart certainly uh, have a strong track record of understanding the kinds of business decisions that they can take that will enhance their bottom line. Uh, and what these executives concluded is that uh, offering more flexible scheduling policies to their workers and raising their wages uh, was good for their bottom line and good for business. So the reason I think it's notable is that Republicans' excuse for not raising the minimum wage is that it's bad for business. So uh, I think this is, th this is the reason that we hold up this example, uh, as we have with other private sector companies that have also sought to raise their workers' wages. They find that it's good for business. They find that it's good for the economy, and they find that it's good for their bottom line. Uh, we believe everybody should benefit from it. Would it be good for all businesses, though, or just those that are as big as Walmart? I mean, some businesses might not be able to afford it as well. Well, uh, you know, again, this is something that when you look at the macroeconomic impact and when you look at the individual experience of, uh, of businesses, uh, that they have found that it's good for the bottom line. And there are a number of small businesses that we've, uh, that we've uh, uh, held up as uh, employers who are doing the right thing by their employees. Uh, and again, I'm confident that as business owners, um, they are not motivated solely uh, by charity. They're also motivated by profit, and they do believe uh, that this is good for their bottom line, that it uh, allows them to do a better job of retaining their workers, which cuts down on their uh, training costs. Uh, it also inspires greater loyalty uh, among their workforce, uh, and that is a good thing. And again, this can take a variety of forms. It can take, uh, it can be as simple as uh, increasing the pay in their paycheck. Uh, it can also take the form of uh, offering up uh, paid sick leave uh, or policies that allow a flexible uh, work schedule. Uh, these are the kinds of things that uh, will make a real difference in the lives of middle-class families, and that's why the President has advocated uh, putting in place these policies all across the country, uh, not just in a, a few select locations where they've chosen to take action. Okay. Mark, another birthday boy. Yeah, thanks. So happy birthday. Thanks. Is there a birthday interview with the President program that uh, <laughs> I might qualify for? Uh, if so, it seems like there'd be a lot of radio reporters interviewing the President today. Between you and Mark, and I saw that uh, uh, one of your colleagues at uh, Sirius XM is having a birthday today, Tim Farley. So something in the, in the water, I guess, uh, about, about being born on this day. <laughs> I'm sorry? I don't mind going first. Oh, okay. I Let's... thought it was part of your send a fourth grader to the park uh, program. <laughs> <laughs> Will some of yesterday's trip to Chicago be uh, billed out as political travel? Uh, I don't believe so. The, the president was using his, uh, 
Uh, again, another example of the President using his executive authority, his official authority, uh, to uh, travel to Chicago and designate uh, Pullman Park as a national monument. He stopped at a phone bank for Rahm Emanuel and uh, gave remarks there that were totally partisan. Doesn't that qualify as political yeah. travel? Well, I'd have to check with the attorneys. I don't believe that uh, 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 it does. It, it, it means there's a political stop, but the reason for the travel was uh, to make this uh, uh, presidential announcement about uh, the Pullman National Monument. But under the rules, to, isn't, aren't you required to um, deduct some of the uh, taxpayers supported travel from political travel? Uh, well, let's, um, I can follow up with you and we can dig in on the rules on this. Yes. Okay, yes. And one other question. Did the President make any decision yesterday about the site for his presidential library? Uh, he, it, the President has not made any decisions, uh, but um, he did have the opportunity to get a briefing, uh, get a little update on uh, the progress of the committee that's been formed to evaluate uh, the proposals that have been put forward by a number of locations. I believe they include New York, Hawaii, and Chicago. Uh, but the President uh, has not made any decisions yet. Um, what, I think one way you can tell that it was not a decision-making meeting necessarily is that the First Lady wasn't there. Uh, I anticipate that she'll have some uh, input on this decision as well. So, uh, but you know, when we're ready to, uh, when a decision has been uh, reached and we're ready to roll out an announcement, uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing from the committee. It lasted two hours, the meeting. Seems like they uh, had a lot, lot of time to discuss the issue. Well, I note that a lot of the people who participated in that meeting are also uh, friends of the President. So, my guess is they were mixing a little business and pleasure. Right. So, Andrew. Um, a question on Libya. Um, Islamic State has claimed responsibility for bombings that have killed up to 40 people in Eastern Libya today. Um, why is there a military? Why is there a military response to Islamic State in Syria and Iraq and not in Libya, given these increased number of attacks that you're seeing there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me say a couple of things about that. The first is that the United States condemns today's terrorist attack uh, near. Uh, Cuba, Libya, that took the lives of more than 40 innocent victims, as well as all the other violence and terrorist acts that have been inflicted on Libya, its people, and others living in Libya in recent months. We send our condolences to the victims and their families and to the people of Libya as they continue to fight back against terrorism. This, <clears throat> pardon me, this latest terrorist attack uh, underscores the need for all Libyan parties, including uh, general national Congress members, to participate in the UN-led dialogue uh, convened by Bernardo Leon, the Special Representative of the UN Secretary General, to form a national unity government. Uh, those who choose not to participate are excluding themselves from discussions which are critical to combating terrorism, as well as to the overall peace, stability, and security of Libya. The best way to counter these terrorists who are operating in Libya is to help the Libyan people build the national consensus that they need to fight these groups uh, instead of each other. And ultimately, that is what we're focused on, is that we have seen uh, that violent extremists and terrorists have sought to use instability uh, in one country or another to establish a safe haven. Uh, that's certainly what they have attempted to do in Yemen. Uh, it's, a, it's certainly what they uh, had designs on doing in Syria. And that is why you've seen the United States take uh, pretty aggressive action in both of those places uh, to, uh, to counter their ability to establish a safe haven there. Uh, we're mindful and have been for some time of the ongoing insecurity and instability uh, inside of Libya. Uh, and we have been supportive of this UN-led dialogue uh, to try to um, bring some more stability to that situation. And in doing so, uh, it will enhance the ability of the central government to provide for the security of the Libyan people uh, and ensure that radical extremists and terrorists are not able to use it as a safe haven to carry out attacks either against the Libyan people or against other people in the region. So uh, we're very mindful of the situation in, in Libya. We obviously condemn in strongest possible terms uh, today's uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, and it's a situation that we're going to continue to monitor. Uh, but while we do that, we're going to continue to be supportive of uh, the UN-led dialogue. Uh, just a, a, another one on Ukraine. Um, the State Department said that the, the <coughs> Russian-backed rebels have broken the ceasefire 250 times. Um, are more sanctions now inevitable? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the United States does continue to be deeply troubled by ongoing military operations conducted by Russian-backed separatists in Ukraine, which have continued despite Russian and separatist commitments to a, quote, immediate and comprehensive ceasefire. Uh, this is a commitment that they reaffirmed in the February 12th Minsk implementation plan. 
Russia and the separatists it backs have acted in direct contravention of the Minsk implementation plan. Uh, and we call on all the signatories to that document to carry out the commitments undertaken in the plan and the September Minsk agreements fully and without delay. Despite these aggressive actions, we continue to support a negotiated solution to the crisis. Uh, at the same time, we've made repeatedly clear that President Putin has a choice. Uh, we've also made it crystal clear uh, that the longer that the Putin regime continues to refuse to abide by uh, the commitments that they've made in the context of <coughs> diplomatic negotiations, uh, that the risk of higher costs uh, will continue to increase. Uh, we have, we have seen that the sanctions regime that's already been in place uh, only tightens as time goes by. The Russia becomes further isolated, and whether you evaluate uh, the investment climate in Russia or the value of the currency uh, or future projections of economic growth, uh, that Russia has taken a hit, and that hit worsens as the weeks and months go by. Uh, so that is, uh, that is, that's, that's the status quo, is that the uh, impact of the sanctions regime uh, is having more of a bite. Uh, what's also possible is that it's possible that there could be uh, additional costs uh, over and above those increasing costs that could be imposed. Uh, but any sorts of decisions like that will be made in coordination uh, with our allies in Europe. Uh, and we have valued the kind of close cooperation we've gotten so far from our allies over there. Uh, and that cooperation will continue uh, in an effort to maximize the impact of these costs. I guess my question is, if you're saying they've broken the ceasefire 250 times, how many times do they have to break it before you say, okay, we're not, we're not thinking about this anymore, we're going to implement more sanctions? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that, that's a legitimate question. And certainly as we see Russia uh, fail to live up to those commitments, and President Putin in particular failed to live up to those commitments, uh, it does uh, put um, them at risk of facing even higher costs. Uh, and uh, the question has always been, uh, and this is a question I've gotten in this room before, has always been at what point do the costs become sufficiently high that uh, Russia and President Putin reevaluates his strategy for uh, his country's actions in uh, eastern Ukraine? Uh, and that's something that we're going to continue to watch. And if uh, the President determines in consultation with our allies in Europe that additional sanctions are needed and additional costs should be imposed, uh, then we'll act in coordinated fashion to impose them. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Jessica, I'll give you the last one. Just going back to the Mosul attack briefing, I um, just wanted to be clear in your answer to Alexis. Did you or did you not know that CENTCOM was doing a briefing with reporters? Uh, well, as I, again, as I explained to Alexis, I'm not aware of all of the, the background briefings that are, or, you know, or even on the record briefings that are conducted uh, all across the uh, federal government on a daily basis. Follows. Was there any effort by the White House to make coalition partners aware that CENTCOM would be discussing the operational details of the Mosul attack? Well, uh, again, I, I'm not in a position to confirm that the, that the details that they cited are uh, accurate. Uh, but there is uh, a lot of intensive international coordination that actually goes on at CENTCOM. Many of you will recall that uh, when the President went to CENTCOM last fall, uh, he met with representatives from other countries who are uh, integrated with the efforts uh, at CENTCOM. Uh, and we take very seriously, and I know that the Department of Defense takes very seriously, the responsibility that they have uh, to closely coordinate with our partners and, partners and allies who are part of this coalition. Uh, so again, you'd have to check with uh, Central Command about whether or not they uh, uh, incorporated uh, these foreign representatives either in that briefing, during the briefing, or in advance of it. Um, so but there wouldn't be a White House role there to inform coalition partners on that? Well, uh, again, I, not necessarily. Not necessarily. What about informing Qatar that, uh, better that um, they were going to be outed as a training site when they hadn't been before? Well, uh, again, I don't know that they were. Um, I don't know that they were outed. I'm not aware that. Um, uh, well, it doesn't mean that the that Qatar wasn't ready to announce it. Um, the uh, the president, however, uh, I guess this is a good segue to the week ahead. Um, the president will be hosting the. Uh, there you go. That was good. Uh, the President will host the Emir of Qatar, um, uh, Sheikh Tamim, uh, at the White House on Tuesday, February 24th. The President looks forward to discussing with Sheikh Tamim political, economic, and security issues of mutual concern to our two countries. The United States and Qatar have a longstanding partnership, and this meeting is an opportunity to further that relationship along with our shared interest in supporting stability and prosperity in the Middle East. Uh, so I'm jumping ahead. That meeting will occur Tuesday here at the White House. Uh, on Monday, the President will meet with the National Governors Association 
Uh, in the afternoon, he'll participate in an ambassador credentialing ceremony in the Oval Office. Uh, at this event, as you've seen in the past, the President will receive the credentials from foreign ambassadors recently posted in Washington. The presentation of credentials is a traditional ceremony that marks the formal beginning of an ambassador's service in Washington. Uh, I mentioned that on Tuesday, the President will meet with uh, Sheikh Tamim. Uh, on Wednesday, the President will travel to Miami, Florida to participate in an immigration town hall meeting hosted by Telemundo. Uh, further details about the President's travel to Florida will be made available in coming days. Uh, on Thursday, the President will attend meetings at the White House. Uh, at that evening, the President First Lady will host a reception celebrating Black History Month in the East Room. Uh, and then on Friday, the President will welcome President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia to the White House. President Sirleaf's visit comes at a time of critical cooperation between the United States and Liberia. The President looks forward to building on a strong and historic partnership with Liberia and discussing a range of topics with President Sirleaf, including the ongoing Ebola response, the region's economic recovery plans, and other issues of mutual interest. Uh, with that, I hope you all have a tremendous weekend. Thank you. Are we going to get any readouts of uh, calls to foreign leaders today? Uh, there is a possibility of that, so stay tuned. Will we'll there know. be a veto event next week on <coughs> Keystone? Uh, if there is, we'll let you know. Do you want to say? Actually, I did, so I'm glad that you uh, brought that up. Let me get through uh, this. Um, the uh, What I was reminded of after uh, our discussion on this topic on Wednesday is that the President a couple of times uh, has been asked this directly. Uh, and the President himself has said that he tends not to comment on communications that he has had with foreign leaders. Uh, he has in the past uh, acknowledged exchanging letters with the Supreme Leader. Um, but as I said on, on Wednesday, uh, we don't have any new details to share with you. Uh, the one thing I will say is that contrary to um, some recent reports, uh, there has been no recent letter from either side. Um, speaking more broadly about our policies vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Iran, uh, our message both in private and in public has been consistent, uh, that the United States will not allow Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon and that we encourage them uh, to engage constructively with the international community to resolve the international community's concerns uh, about their nuclear program. Uh, as you've also heard us say, you know, we've raised uh, significant concerns about Iran's support for terror activities and other destabilizing activities in the Middle East. Uh, and we often, uh, and even in the context of these letters, have raised concerns about Americans who are being held uh, against their, w their will or are missing in Iran. Uh, and uh, those are things that we've said publicly many times, and that's consistent uh, with the private messages that the President has communicated uh, to the Supreme Leader in letters that they've previously exchanged. Okay. Thanks, guys.